I guess my advice to founders would be to avoid being cagey about sharing information. I understand there is risk in your confidential information leaking, so to speak. 99% of VC actors are, are good ones. Yes, maybe you don't want to share everything initially up front in your, you know, your initial overview pitch deck. And, you know, I think there's tactical things you can use DocSend to, to kind of, you know, put some gates around who gets shared and how and why and that kind of thing. But after you're in a, one or two conversations and you feel like there's a rapport building and there's trust, um, you should be able, you should be willing to share your the entirety of your business. And if for some reason you feel uncomfortable sharing with a specific VC, that's signal. Like if you don't think, oh, I'm not gonna trust this person, don't, well, first of all, if you don't think you're gonna trust this person, don't trust them and, mm -hmm. and fundraise somewhere else. Because, you know, if you're getting the spidey sense that this is not right, then I think you trust it and move on because it's not, it's not worth it to jeopardize. I mean, but I think on the whole, default towards being trusting until you feel otherwise, as opposed to the other way around. Hi, David. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. It's, I'm, it's, I'm looking forward to chatting. Okay, awesome. So like the first time I did discover your fun was um, because of like, I watch a YouTube video and then they suggested like the next view template for entrepreneurs, like how you pitch your company. So that's like yes. probably the first time I discover it. I just think it was like it's such a genius idea to like, you know, incorporate into like the, I guess, like to attract the best founders because everyone need a template. Yeah, well... Well, two things. One, we if you go to our website, we have what we call our pitch to founders. Mm -hmm. And if you like, you go to many, most other VC, I mean, almost every other VC uh, websites, they talk about like how, hey, we're partners to entrepreneurs, we're there by your side and blah, blah, blah. And like entrepreneurs, you know, have to put together a pitch deck and, and pitch all these VCs. We wanted to have a pitch deck that was our, our pitch to entrepreneurs and why they should choose us. Um, and so we, we have that on our website. And then yes, we have a template for folks that are fundraising for both seed and, and kind of series A that they can use. Um, and rather than just completely start from scratch. Um, they can use that uh, as the kind of the basis for their own kind of fundraising. And there's like different slides about go to market slide or a traction slide and overview slides mm -hmm. and use as, as kind of the basis for your own you know, composition. Behind the genius move, um, you know, I dig deeper into your earlier career. You started a company. It's like an email. Co you founded a co-founded an email marketing company yeah. and then eventually um, sold it to a bot.com. And then later on, you work at um, Massahat Venture Partners and Venrock before you started your own fun and yeah. to start the show i would love to learn a little bit more about like you know what was founding the email marketing company like in the 90s and like yep. you know how does that shape you into you know um the the current inventor and yeah we briefly chat about like the master hat experience yeah so think it's basically turn back the clock it's web 1.0 era and we started this company it was called some boston media we had basically had a series of consumer facing email newsletters one of them was a daily deals news Newsletter. One was a it was called Bargain Dog. I grew that to about five million registered users. We had a, a style focused one, and they're kind of like these newsletters are kind of like a predecessor <laughs> to Daily Candy, is the way I kind of characterize it now. You know, we we generated quite a wide audience for them. It was very early days of kind of Web 1.0 era that we had technology that was able to generate kind of customized, personalized email newsletters <laughs> for every recipient. And then, so we set up selling the company to about.com for about $35 million. It was a tax return for our initial investors. From there, you know, I became VP of marketing at, at about.com, you know, kind of a mm -hmm. classic web web 1.0 <laughs> uh, company. And, you know, we went from four founders to we sold the company to about 35 people to a public company about.com was a couple hundred people. Then that company got acquired by another company that was thousands of people. So in the span of, you know, a couple of years, I went from an organization of, of four of us founders to being <laughs> a larger, really larger kind of publicly traded um, company. It's quite the, quite quite a great experience, kind of you know er, early in my career actually. Yeah, I'm actually curious, like since like I have a strong passion for like starting media companies, I'm just curious, what was like the journey like? So in terms of like when you started the company, like did you picture the best outcome, and then like what was the exit that you were expecting? 
And what were, I guess, like some couple phases that you went through when you started a company with three friends and then like later on it became, you know, it got acquired and then like how, what are some benchmarks to get acquired in general? And then since you guys have like a 10x return, what were the journey like to build up to that? Like, did you intentionally trying to build like a company to get acquired or like, did you try to intentionally build a company that's to IPO and then like the dot com bubble happen or something like that? Yeah. So early days, we just wanted to start something new. And it was four of us. We we literally had an office. You can picture an office that I don't know how we were in this mm-hmm. building, but there were no windows in our office. Mm-hmm. There were there was brick wall on three sides and then a drywall on the back side. So we had no mm-hmm. windows. And I was just trying to figure out, experiment something that could work. We tried a couple other things that was not probably not worth going into the details and like mm-hmm. what we were tried initially. But then Early on, we figured out this this idea around deals, and and we basically would had technology that could find some of the best e commerce sales and deals on the on the net, and then we would aggregate them and put them into an e- email newsletter. Um, so then the, the so the first space was exploration, and I we see that today at Nextview. Um, you know, it's, it's exploration, trying to hone in on the idea, and then once some then it's like pulling a thread. After that, it's like okay, something's working. Mm-hmm. Let's let's keep pulling like what, what can we do more and more right and so we would you know we got to the phase where uh it was working and we launched you know, our flagship newsletter we ended up getting hundreds of thousands of users and then up into millions of users and so it was kind of it was pulling on a thread and then we just got to the early stages of like i would call it kind of the growth period where you're just doubling down and going faster mm-hmm. um you know at that point we were about 35 people you know the startup journeys i mean Ours ended you know, some, somewhat early in, in a good way. I think, you know, uh, most companies are not, you know, we were not going out to look to be acquired, mm-hmm. but uh, about.com was a, a partner on the business development front. Um, we were in the process of, you know, starting a, both a marketing relationship and a couple of other relationships with them. And then one thing led to another and then the dialogue and it, it seemed like we could do a lot more than, you know, being part of a, a larger organization. And, you know, that's a truism, I think, across startup land that like, well, two things, I think one, companies are, you know, are, are, are bought, not sold is kind of the truism, right? Like mm-hmm. if we had gone out and said, okay, we're going to try to sell the company. I don't know. That's really the best mindset to have mm-hmm. as well as the, the, the way to approach it from a, just to, you know, to have, to have the highest chance of success. And then the second is like, and we've seen this at next few now that we've had companies, you know, we're, we're getting involved in the, the seed stage and we can talk about next few in a bit. Uh, we get around the very earliest stage, but you know we've had, um, I think, out of our portfolio of 160 something odd companies, eight unicorns, four of which have exited in some way. We've had a couple IPOs, a couple of companies get acquired for more than a billion dollars. But all along the way, great companies always get offers, mm-hmm. and so you know, candidly, I was with a number of co-founders. We were young in our career, and you know, it was the kind of the first good offer that came along, and we took it. And but I think you know, companies that turn out to be great. They could do, you know, have a bigger impact than the, even the one that I started. Like, they're gonna get offers all along, all along the way. You mentioned that you really enjoy like the company creation stage. What were something about the company's creation stage that you find exciting? Because since like a lot of people enjoy the company managing stage, yeah. I just love the beginning, and I just want to be part of the beginning over and over again. To me, it's something about the process of going from like. There's nothing to having something. There's so much possibility when you have nothing that you can do anything. And mm-hmm. then you like will this thing into existence. You will a company into an existence. And so, you know, I've been involved with the company which we've been talking about. I was involved with a failed startup. We can talk about that if you want. And I'm involved with starting next view. Um, and, you know, each of those times, like some of my favorite moments have been at those various, you know, very earliest of stages. I think the exciting thing about being a, venture capitalist and being a seed stage investor is that um, I get to be part of that story over and over mm-hmm. and over again with all of our portfolio companies. Now, it's not the exact same as being the founder and being on the founding team and being right there, but to be part of that, you know, just be a small part of that story over and over and to do it not serially, but to like have a number of projects you're working on at the same time. Like that's, that's what motivated me kind of intrinsically to do you know do what i do what we do what are like i mean what do you see as your like unfair advantage or what is like one skill that you're constantly trying to get better at it changes over the life of you know one's career i think now personally it's around we are seed stage specialists that's all we do is we invest at the seed stage 
And you know, now we as a firm have been involved with over 160 companies over the last dozen years. I think whether you're a consumer facing e-commerce company to a B2B SaaS company, there are certain things that just rhyme with the first six, 12, 18 months mm-hmm. uh, after you raise a seed round. And my goal really is to be a thought partner for the entrepreneurs to help navigate that time period. And given that that's where we spend all of our time, like we can really be different than other venture firms that are either multi-sector or multi-stage or have a more kind of spray and pray approach and do lots and lots and lots of different investments. We can really be, um, you know, that, that, that thought partner for entrepreneurs that we work with. When you were thinking about like um, starting your own fund. So before we talk about starting the fund, like I think one of the major component about like being an uh, investor is like to have a really solid network. And you obviously did such a great job on like, you know, building the fund and then like raising bigger and bigger funds each couple of years. And yeah. um, so who is on your like personal board of advisors? And then how do you kind of build up this network for yourself? I can think of like three mentors along the way. I mean, I've worked at two different venture funds before. And in each of those, I had, you know, a VC, they, they often say it's kind of an apprenticeship model. And so, you know, I was an apprentice to, to kind of senior investors. I had very different styles. So at the first fund I was at, it was a first time venture fund. I saw firsthand the how to start a firm. Well, the, one of the main principals there, Rich Levendov, he was actually an angel investor in my startup mm-hmm. before. And then the reason I joined his firm was because of that relationship. And he's a very um, intuitive investor. Um, he has a good sense of, he's just a great gut about markets. Um, and I learned kind of a, a lot of intangible style of investing from him. After that, I went to Benrock, which is, you know, one of the oldest venture capital firms uh, originally are investing Rockefeller, ma- Rockefeller family money. The firm's been around now for 50 years. They've been doing, they have a process and a way of doing things that, obviously has been you know, extremely successful. And so I kind of learned the venture business there and kind of a classic, like just the most classic mm-hmm. series A way. You know, my mentor there, uh, Mike Terrell, is very analytical thinker uh, as opposed to uh, intuitive. And so I saw like, there is no right one way to be a successful venture capitalist. And so I learned two different styles of thinking and approaching, you know, my own lens, crafting my own lens for investments. And then, but Mike also paid attention to markets, but he also was very people driven. And so I learned that thought process about, you know, making early stage investments. And so like having those two kind of mentors within uh, the venture industry. And then I have a third one, uh, it's Guys, his name is Kevin Malloy. He's uh, now he's a hedge fund manager. He's a little, I would say called under the radar, so to speak, as many hedge fund guys are. But he pushes, I've known him for a number of decades uh, and uh, he's both a personal friend and a kind of mentor. And he both pushes me more broadly outside of VC. He's not just in our VC world. He thinks a little bit more broadly just investing. And then we have similar values. And so he's helped be a professional mentor, but it'll be a personal mentor a mentor that kind of bridges the personal and and professional divide, if that makes sense. You mentioned like he's more on the intuitive side and then your second mentor was more on the analytical side. I'm curious, what are some like specific lessons that you took that you feel like both of these uh, mental models could work in terms of investing and how how did that shape who you into like you know partner with your current partners at next view with rich he used to joke uh kind of tongue-in-cheek that you only you only do diligence to either kill a potential investment you were you weren't going to do anyway or you you're doing it just to con- convince yourself something you were going to do anyway my, my takeaway from that was you don't want to do due diligence just for the sake of it you have to figure mm-hmm. out like why you're doing it and really cut to the heart of of what's the issue? What's what's the key risk point in this potential investment? And just go there and push there and push hard there. You don't have to waste your time just spinning wheels on stuff that isn't important. The, the idea is to get to the core issue as quickly as possible and then push there, then figure out is it, you know, meet the criteria to be able to take the leap of faith required for an investment. Mm-hmm. You know, at Venrock with Rich and then kind of more broadly, there it was structured thinking. You know, you think about even here at NextView, we have um, an internal investment memo, which we write for mm-hmm. every single one of our investments. Um, so for literally for the hundreds of investments we've, we've written over the last decade plus, we've written a two to four page investment memo. And you know it's in the section of okay, what's the summary? What's the market opportunity? What what talk about the team? What's the uh, you know financials associated? What's the product? What are the risks? What are the pluses? And then 
they also had um, uh, this idea at Venrock, it was called the glimmer of greatness. What, 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 what if the best thing happened, what could this company become? What's the mm. absolute, the best and the most perfect world? What, you know, what, what could be the grandest thing that could happen here? And so we actually took that template and that that is the, that we learned at Venrock. We, I, we use that template, I mean, with a little bit of tweaks, but at, at, at next to you here. Because I think the just structured approach to thinking about investment, you know, I think ultimately, you know, you mentioned it yourself, uh, you know, as newer, and it's like, it's a mix between the like gut driven and you know the 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 the, the head driven, right? Like you need both, mm-hmm. and so you got to do all the work with the the thoughtfulness. But I think at the end of the day, you know, the an investment eventually comes from internalizing everything up here, but then you know making the investment with with your gut at the end of the day. In terms of like building your own fund, as you mentioned, you probably took some inspiration from like the Venrack memo deck, and yeah. like um in terms of like shaping your own fund, like you know how did you find your kind of like co-founders and then when you guys like were sitting together how do you identify like what is each person's role in this fund and when you first started your fund since it was like I believe it was like 12 years ago and then how do you kind of mentally internalizing like you know like did you know that you will build a fund that's like forever and like how do you kind of like select the deals that could be a solid deal to build the fund in that way like because I think I've also heard it like in one of your interviews that you mentioned that you don't have to have like couple billion like billion dollar unicorn or something to return the fund in a good way yeah. and then like you mentioned that you you guys only need to achieve a, in a certain degree because you already have like let's say three uh really solid portfolio companies like i think those are like two different ways of thinking because i definitely seen there are like a lot of like really great investors that they just have like one or two deals that like making their entire career what they do is like essentially like a numbers game right like you invest into something company one of them will be snapchat or like facebook or something but when you are thinking like you know from an investment return perspective like shaping the returns you know you probably need to just select like three let's say like 10 like deals that's 10x whatever the and then the font was like kind of like making it back i started the firm with Two of my partners, Rob and Lee, we were all kind of, I would say, called mid-level investment professionals at other venture firms. Um, you know, I think part of the, and we had known each other through the, just through the startup ecosystem. Candidly, and I think this is one of the biggest risks when uh, we first started, both for us and for LPs, we had never worked together and we knew each other. I mean, I knew my partner, Rob, he and I both were, went to Duke undergrad and, and worked the same consulting firm right out of college. And so we had a long history, but we never, you know, worked together and invested together. So the first thing we did before we even raised any outside money um, is we formed an LLC and we just started investing our own personal capital. And we are angel investing. Um, now, small dollars, but that helped us put together processes around um, how we wanted to work together and develop an explicit ethos around what are the things that we valued creating a firm. So there are tactical things, like we have a voting process on how we how we vote on new investments that we established 12 years ago or 13 years ago. And that's this, still the same way we do it now. And we've added two new partners over the last you know decade. Uh, Melody, who joined us and leads our New York office. Um, she joined us about five years ago. And then in 2022, uh, Stephanie joined us and you know leads our San Francisco office. And we, but we still vote in the, in the same way that we established you know a dozen or so years ago. But that also... Uh, allow just for a foundation for culture. And then I think one, to, you know, another part of your question was just around like building an enduring firm. You know, I think that's something which we set out to do from day one. You know, I think a number of seed investors, if we start as angels and they're like, okay, maybe I'll do this for a while or they turn it into a firm and it's like, oh, we'll see what kind of comes out of it. But we said from the beginning, we wanted to create a firm in a franchise that we were going to make our careers work. And we started the firm in our thirties. I'm still a young guy. I'm only 46. And so I've got a couple <laughs> more decades of doing this and that's, and that's my intent to do so. And we even, you know, we're investing out of our fifth fund and I, you know, I hope we do it. I'm, I'm at least a part of another half dozen or more from, from here. What are some other like ways that you kind of like differentiate yourself or like how you, in terms of fund strategy or like return wise, like how do you kind of do the mental modeling on like, you know, the type of company that you would haunt yeah. after. One thought is around, we do, we have this theme around what we call the everyday economy. And the idea there is we're looking to invest in companies that take best in class technology and they apply it to people's everyday lives in some way. What that means is probably a half or a little bit more than half of our investments are consumer facing. 
And that's everything from e-commerce to social to paid subscription, but some kind of consumer facing business. And then, but half of what we do is B2B. It's either enabling layer technologies that facilitate a consumer experience in some ways, mm -hmm. or it's kind of B2B software where the end user is the that is what matters. And so it's a, it's a per, you know, it's people that are using it in their everyday work lives. But we tend to shy away from kind of B2B businesses that are way deeper down in the stack and for structure. We're not going to invest in a security company selling to a CIO somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like they're just outside of like, a con it's too many steps away from a consumer experience. And so we look at things always on like, does this change people's everyday lives or end users in some, you know, can this affect millions and millions of people in some way? And to, to your point, that's an intentionally squishy theme, but it's intentionally a generalist theme, as opposed to a firm that is like, hey, we're just a crypto fund or we're just a AI fund or something that's very, like, you know, as I mentioned before, we're, we set out to create an enduring franchise that will last decades and the technologies and the waves of what's exciting and where the opportunities are, are going to change over each decade. Mm -hmm. And so we want to have a theme to what we do, but we want to be able to evolve to be opportunistic around where entrepreneurs are innovating. We, we would rather listen to where the entrepreneurs are innovating as opposed to saying, oh, this is where we think the change is going to come from. All of our funds have been sm relatively small comparative kind of broader, you know, currently, you know, you, you've seen many VCs really raise billions and billions of dollars of funds, right? Even our most recent fund, it's $135 million fund for our, our seeds, our seed fund. That's for five partners. So, you know, just a little bit more than $25 million per partner. You know, that allows us to invest in companies and part of from a philosophical approach, we're trying to invest in companies that can be exceptional, that can have be on cars and can have that multi-billion dollar return. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had a company called Parsec, which was acquired by Unity for just over $300 million. And, and that returned half our fund. And so it's like, mm -hmm. you don't need billions and billions of dollar outcomes for a smaller fund to really move to really move the needle. And so that's been part of the kind of philosophy from day, day one is to have a right size fund that's appropriate for the seed stage, which is where we, where we play. Let's say like you and I start a fund today. Like yeah. what are, let's say like three things that we have to think about, like based on like our conversation, I think like there's one thing you kind of mentioned, like you and your partner would put your own money into um, some investments at the beginning. Yeah. So like it was kind of like building the track record. And then besides like the building the track record part, like what are like, let's say three things that we need to do to get this ready um by what we need to do it could be like really detailed into let's say like make an excel list of like the potential lps or the people that would introduce us to 400 lps or something like what are what what would be the our thinking framework to go through this i think about our business in like there's five functions there's sourcing like where do you where do you find the companies selecting how do you make the decision i'll use the we use the word internally winning meaning like how do you win investment and then how do you support your portfolio companies after you're an investor fundraising um and so how you know where do you raise your capital from lps and then the last one is maintaining how as you grow do you just have the infrastructure to be able to support of the firm those are the five functions that we think about i think you need to think about on the day one of starting a new firm and mm -hmm. you know we have uh at our offsite that's coming off in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. we already have an internal doc that those five things are at the top of the board and so i don't think those things change i think you want to have a, a set plan on all five of those now and figure out you know are you going to differentiate you don't have to other you need to differentiate on all five you have to differentiate on some dimension of some of the five and figure out where you're going to be different and where you're going to be the same and have a plan and, and go and you know as i said i think uh and when we first started next view it changes over time. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. some of it, uh, we had a specific kind of sourcing mechanism early on that's less relevant today. Um, I think, as I said, our selection process is something that we've we've started with and it's pretty true to where we started um, mm -hmm. uh, started with. We've, we've honed it a little bit, but it's basically the same as in the beginning and it's worked quite well and, and it's scaled as we've added other partners. And so I think about it within that kind of source, select, win, fundraise, and maintain framework is the way I think about it. So let's say if you're a VC that you can cover, like, let's say sourcing or like one of the subjects, like 
what are other things that like I guess you can just partner with like the people who can. Well, I think that's it. I think that's the beauty. I have great partners. When you have a partnership, and by the way, we have we have an equal partnership. I don't think that's the only way to do it, but that's how our model works. You know, when you have partners, not everyone has to do everything, and you can have <laughs> you can have functional experts at you know any one of the above. Those different things can don't have to be static. Those can change over time. But if you were starting a firm and you had a, a specific sourcing differentiation, but you didn't know about uh, fundraising or the operations of a venture firm, you can partner with someone who you know might have those those functional expertise as well. In terms of sourcing, I feel like you know knowing a lot of great founders or like knowing a lot of people who can found the company may not be like enough because like can you define like what would be like a good way to source good companies since you guys I believe it was like the fourth time you guys created the accelerator and then I'm curious like what are some ways that you kind of differentiate yourself from like the sourcing perspective and also I think selecting is even harder I worked in venture before but I feel like I only work briefly so like I would not know if I would select the best companies because I think it's really hard to select and there's no almost no information and then when you just met the founder unless you have like a really strong network that you other people can kind of vouch for them it's really hard to like just be like oh i totally deeply believe in they can succeed what are some ways to quickly figure out like if you would back them having exceptional sourcing is necessary but it's not sufficient and you kind of talked mm-hmm. about that like that's that's a huge plus but it's not you know that that's not enough i think to be a great venture investor it's the most it's one of the, one of the more salient things like people mm-hmm. like you know it's like that's the thing that's up in people's faces but because it's just the most observable and then on, on, and then on the other comment i'll have there is i don't think there's there is one magic bullet um i think yeah, it's a it's a combination of many things and you're kind of more of an approach as opposed to uh, a magic bullet because if you i think if you have one magic bullet uh that that, that can decay over time what 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 is was exceptional sourcing mechanism ten years ago or five years ago might not be the be the same or even relevant on the selecting side. I mean, my comment there, it's tough. I mean, it is a hard hard challenge. I mean, you think about any almost all founders, anyone who gets funded is smart and going after a big opportunity. And by de- not by definition, but like most startups fail. Mm-hmm. Right? So you have smart people going after big opportunities, but most of them fail. And like so and that's your baseline. I think one of the frameworks we think about and and now that we've had the experience of a firm over a dozen years is you realize you're not going, you're not trying to find the average startup. You're trying to find the exceptions. And so when you're selecting, you're trying to select not for one that you think could be, maybe you could be, could be successful. And if it is, it's moderately successful. If this is successful, could it just be exceptional? Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, you know, as I said, we invested in over 160 companies over the last dozen years. From a return standpoint, I'd say 10 of them matter. And so, you know, again, it's a little disheartening to think about, okay, less than 10% of the companies that I'm going to be involved with are going to be really from a a value driver standpoint, but I'm going to have a relationship with all these founders and I'm going to spend most of my time in the the other areas, you know, select selection matters, but I think you need to have that framework. And it's one thing to know that theoretically, but now, especially as we've had that experience, we've actually just seen it and felt it. um, You just approach selection differently. You know, the last thing you can talk about is, uh, so we did, so our typical investment is to lead a seed round or a pre-seed round. So we'll write a $1 million check, one to $3 million check into a two to $4 million seed, pre-seed or seed round. That's kind of our typical bread and butter. And we'll, we'll either lead or co-lead those rounds, catalyze those rounds, come together, and then take a really active role with our companies, pick a board seed or an active board observer role. You mentioned our accelerator, that's a little bit different product. So we do it once a year. We've done this. We just launched it here. Um, we are having a conversation in January of 2023. We've been doing it since uh, right at the beginning of COVID. We launched a virtual accelerator in the spring of 2020. Take a step back. It's, it's different than most accelerators. You know, as accelerators have proliferated over the last decade, they've gotten bigger and bigger. There's bigger cohort sizes. Sometimes the terms on the deal is a little bit opaque. And they're really just these machines that are just churning out companies to go to a demo day. We we wanted to take an accelerator that kind of turned all that on its head. So our accelerator has super small cohorts. We have six, like I think last year we had six teams, just half a dozen or so. They're very clear terms for 400K investment, which is actually pretty meaningful in these very early stage Genesis stage startups. And then you get bespoke programming 
and meaningful time with each and every the next few partners. There's no relocating, but there's, uh, so it's mostly virtual, but there's in real life opportunities in both New York and San Francisco for community connection. And the, the ultimate goal isn't a demo day. We don't have a demo day at the end, but rather whenever the companies that graduate are ready to fundraise, we will be a guide to empower them for their fundraising process. And that could be the day after the accelerator is complete or it could be a year later. So we don't jam them all into the same timeline. Like a typical accelerator says, okay, it's demo day. Now it's time to fundraise. So it's a really kind of personalized experience that's very different than most accelerators out there. So it's a little bit different product than our typical you know, seed stage investment where it's a little bit smaller dollars for very early stage companies. And we, we just announced you know, our fourth, as I said, our applications for our fourth accelerator, which uh, opened uh, here in January. And I think they're due you know, middle of February of 2023. In terms of investment return, do you feel like that solitaire was giving you like what you were looking for? And in terms of like, uh, you know, selecting these companies, like what type of company do you particularly like leaning towards? To? Like what at what stage? Um, Like, let's say like if they already have customers or like, uh, because I think like when I was reading the description, it was kind of, you can't really have a, a half big product before you apply. Like, what does that mean? And like, what is a half big product and since like everybody like change what they build throughout like the first like couple months we want to have we were looking for teams that are formed they're fully committed to the to the venture you know they're not at a job somewhere and half working and you know it's like they're they're ready to go do this what i would say is there's a thesis there's a there's a thesis around hey here this is the market that we're going after here's a problem statement and here's our proposed solution. That's not to say that if once they get going, of course things are going to change. The solution is definitely going to change. You know, for, <laughs> the problem statement might evolve a little bit, or even like, hey, look, if it's not working at all, then we maybe will change even the 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 market. But uh, you know, the idea is there's like a hypothesis around, hey, here's a problem statement that we see, and here's our proposed solution, and we're going to work, we're going to build a company to kind of pursue that do they have to be like in a specific sector or like a specific like um milestone before they apply no i mean we, we're looking at kind of broadly across our everyday economy thesis i mean so both consumer facing b to b um it's pretty pretty wide open and you know in the past we've had everything from a climate tech company to a p to b e-commerce swapping company so we've it's been pretty kind of broad uh, along the sets in, you know, in our, in our previous cohorts. Are you a technical person or like, do you consider yourself more on the, you know, like non-technical side? Uh, my power alley is I am a marketer and I look for businesses. This is my person, not a next but it's me personally mm-hmm. as an investor. Mm-hmm. I look for businesses that have some type of unfair advantage along the go-to-market side. You know, I've invested in technical founders. I've invested in you know, wide profile, different founders, but where I can really, where I get excited the most is when I'm <laughs> talking with marketers and, and product people have a mar- go to market orientation, if that makes sense. I mean, it's just natural given that, you know, I was a marketer in, in the past, you know, my partner, Rob, he spent a number of years at eBay as a, as a, as a product person. And my <laughs> partner, Melody was head of product and analytics at Blue Apron throughout their entire um, expansion. And so they're product people and they wear a product hat and they, they often resonate um, with product people. And so I think it's just, as I mentioned before, I don't think there's one way to kind of approach venture. And, and so like having the functional expertise uh, is, is one way to have to have a lens. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my partner, Lee, my partner, Lee, is an engineer by background. And so we do have, you know, technical expertise on, on the team. When you are like thinking about the deals that you funded, do you think they are more leaning towards like something that's more less technical? So I consider, let's say like, I think Airbnb is like a less technical company. Yeah, I would say for the most part, not just myself, I think broadly speaking, I would say most, but not most of the investments which we next you make, the risks we're taking are go to market risks. Mm -hmm. They're not technical risks. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, most of the investments we make are software enabled businesses. The question when we invest is not, oh, is this, are we going to develop this, be able to develop the software or not? It's, you know, is this going to be, be able to get this in the hands of customers for adoption so you can get a growth rate that is, you know, that delivers venture scale returns. You mentioned that like among, let's say like the 160 company that you've invested in, there's like about 10 company that are kind of like actually 
worth the investment or like just kind of like bring value to the investment major way like what are like the 10 companies different from like the 160 like well 150 different other companies in terms of like evaluating them did you have a good feeling at the very beginning about these 10 companies or like they're kind of like the random company that among the larger portfolio that um invested in and you also mentioned about like the the memo, the two to four pages memo, you, you talk right. about risk and like what were something that on the memo that like you feel like was a really good framework to, you know, for you to evaluate companies? There's two commonalities amongst all of the, I call it the exceptions. The first one is somewhere along the way, there's product, product market fit just clicked mm. in a way that you didn't have to ask, is there product market fit? If you have to ask, oh, do we think we have product market fit here? The answer is no. Because if it just became blindly obvious, like this is not just working, this is really working. Mm. And so it hits you over the head at some point. That's not to say there aren't going to be challenges to scale. And we've had companies that have had that moment, but then have still had trouble scaling from there. But there is a time where just like, this is just really, really working. The second thing is an intangible piece around, people always say it's, oh, it's about the people. And yes, you want exceptional founders, blah, blah, blah. I think what we found is that companies that are great have founders that have the capacity to level up. We've invested in, you know, repeat founders that are experienced, have done it before, all the way to, I mean, literally college students in their dorm room. I think you can find exceptional founders all along that experience level set. And whether it's here or here, the founders of great companies, they're, they're, they have the capacity for growth. And we've seen that. It's hard to, ahead of time, to identify both of those traits, the capacity for growth and founders and is the the company itself going to hit that product market fit where it just clicks and i would say you don't know you know some of our best companies it took years before something just clicked and i would say even you know five years into each of our funds if you said okay what are the companies that are going to be the ones you still maybe don't know you have even inkling you know which you definitely know which ones aren't going to be it's like it can be a little bit unpredictable it's but part of it because we're investing at the earliest earliest of stages and it takes a while for companies to seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years to, for companies to mature, to be able to go public and things like that. So it, it's, it's a long journey. Do you feel like it was a company that you kind of predict are going to be like big that went big? Or like, do you feel like it was more just overall random? Yeah, it's not random, but it's hard to predict. I mean, that's a, it's a, you can see as companies be start to build momentum, it becomes self-reinforcing, right? So once a company starts to have success, then they're able to attract even more talented people. Mm. And those talented people are going to attract better customers. Mm. So it's customers. like the snowball they're, start rolling. Yeah, that's, it is. It's like a snowball. And so mm. it, 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 it just keeps, it keeps going. And so you can see when the snowball is starting, uh, you can see those glimmers, um, but it's, it's not fully formed until, you know, the thing really unfolds. So we chat about like the, the memo that like, uh, what Sorry. are something that you feel like were like, what are some like core pieces are in the memo that like help you to like screen out the bad companies or like get the good companies? I think it's the positives and risks section. And it's mm -hmm. about identifying the risk. I would rather have us mm -hmm. have a company that we said, hey, this is what I worry, this is what I'm worried about happening that could go wrong. I'd rather that you do that and it does go wrong than mm -hmm. the company fails for some reason you didn't say at all. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you want to be able to get to the heart of like what risk are you taking and what's the you know what, what's the challenge here? What's going to be the hard part? And so I think that's the one section of the memo. The other section of the memo is with the one where you know I, I talked about before the bedrock phrase, which was the glimmer of greatness, how great could this company become? Um, we use the phrase golazo, which is um, a Spanish slang for an exceptional goal in soccer or football. Mm -hmm. My uh, my partner, Lee, is a, is a football fan. If you can identify and describe a company that, that could be great, if you can't do that, there's something wrong, right? Because you're trying mm -hmm. to find an exceptional outcome. And so it's a... It's about envisioning the future. And so I think you want to be able to pass, you know, that test, if that makes sense. When you look at the founders or like the founding team, do you feel like they always have like one specific really strong skill or like you feel like it should be a semi-balanced team that kind of like they can like all function well together. However, they don't really have like secret strengths. Uh, I think you want to have founders that have superpowers, have one or two superpowers, and then they surround themselves with other folks that complement them and can fill in where their detriments are. 
as opposed to like just a well-rounded individual. I think people mm-hmm. that spite you, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, from what I hear, you know, from a, if you're a college admissions officer, you don't want a class of well-rounded students. You want a well-rounded class of exceptional students. And so I think the same mm-hmm. thing is too, true for this a founding team. You know, you want, you want folks who are very different from each other and are conceptual in their own and individual ways that together they create a, a well-rounded set of folks that are coming together. If like you and I are starting a company today, like what are, let's say, three steps that we should take to approach like the fundraising? First, I think it's just be clear about how much you want to raise and and why. And so, and why means, okay, do I really want to try to enrage, raise capital from venture capitalists or perhaps if I raise from angels that might be better suited and you know I think in terms of that is like how much you want to raise and and how hard that's going to be you know putting together the list and I think about fundraising as a search for believers not convinc- not an exercise of convincing the skeptics Mm. But you want to find people that have an affinity for what you're doing, mm-hmm. or I would just say an affinity. And so they could have an affinity for you. Is it people, you know, on the angel side, is it people you've worked for or worked with in the past? You know, is it people that have gone to the same college as you? And that could be for angel investors or for venture capitalists, some, some you know, um, you grew up in the same town. Affinity also means, you know, the domain, find people that if you're if you're starting a B2B SaaS company, find uh, people who invested in other B2B SaaS companies. So they're not gonna have an affinity for what you're doing. And it's because you wanna find folks who who are gonna want to invest not just here, but they're gonna want to invest because of here. And that's true for whether you're raising from individual angels or you're gonna raise from institutional investors. They're gonna make the decision here at the end of the day. You wanna find people who want to believe from the beginning and it's just about helping them along that process as opposed to finding people who have a disposition that they're skeptical and you have to somehow try to convince them because that's that's a that could be a futile exercise. So like after let's say like you chat with a great founder, like how does it process in, internally within within your fund? We, because we're an equal partnership, and we, um, you know, we're not a pyramid structure. It's you know, we have five five partners. It's there's not much process, mm-hmm. and so and there's not there's overhead process. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Each one of our investors here can each partner can, you know, they take we take input from our our peers. Um, but we can we can lead an investment. It's not it's not a consensus driven. Uh, you know, not everyone has to vote yes for an investment to go through. Um, it's a, it's not a consensus driven, um, decision-making model. And so, uh, the process is, you know, you meet, you meet myself, or you meet my partners, they're going to get excited about it. They're going to do some diligence and work on their own. They might introduce you to another one of the partners just for some initial feedback. And then, I mean, and then the kind of the last step is just to, you, you make a presentation to the entire partnership and then everyone's going to weigh in on their point of view. We have, we talked about this in blogs and, and, and publicly quite a bit that regardless of how each one of our partners views it before we make the investment. Once we make the investment, you have not just an investment from me, you have an investment from the entire next few team mm-hmm. and 110% of all the partnership is, is behind you. And, you know, I own a, you know, one fifth of every single outcome and whether I lead investment or my partner Melody leads the investment, I want that investment to be successful. I'm going to do everything I can to make that to make that happen. If you're a founder coming into any VC fund, like how much do you share, right? Like, so there's like a major concern among like founders throughout the years is like, if you share like a lot of data or like a lot of details about your company, uh, what if the VC like is talking to another of your competitors or like even they may uh, eventually back them or whatever, like there's always a concern on like how much do you share? Uh, what are some ways that since you are on the other side of the table now and you mentioned that you have like failed startup and succeed start- startup, like what were your takeaway there? I guess my advice to founders would be to avoid being cagey about sharing information. I understand there is risk in your confidential information leaking, so to speak. 99% of VC actors are are good ones. Yes, maybe you don't want to share everything initially up front in your, you know, your initial overview pitch deck. And, you know, I think there's tactical things. You can use DocSend to, to kind of, you know, put some gates around who gets shared and how and why and that kind of thing. But after you're in a, one or two conversations and you feel like there's a rapport building and there's trust, um, you should be able, you should be willing to share your entire of your business. 
And if for some reason you feel uncomfortable sharing with a specific VC, that's signal. Like if you don't think oh, I, I'm not going to trust this person, don't, well, first of all, if you don't think you're going to trust this person, don't trust them and, mm -hmm. and fundraise somewhere else. Because, you know, if you're getting the spidey sense that this is not right, then I think you trust it and move on because it's not, it's not worth it to jeopardize. Something. But I think on the whole default towards being trusting until you feel otherwise, as opposed to the other way around. Mm, totally. Okay. So another question is like, we've seen trends go around like from year to year. So like last year was crypto, this year is generative AI. And, you know, the year before was like, so since I started engaging with the venture industry since maybe like 2017 or something, there was like, it, there was like AR, VR was a thing. And then 18 was like crypto uh, 19 was like some sort of AI stuff. And then back to 2000, it's like kind of back to crypto again. So I'm curious, like when you see these trends going wrong, do you invest in these trends? Or like, since like um, I read from US blog about like, you know, the down of generative AI and some other uh, really great articles, since you guys are studying the trend in each year. And then like, I'm just curious, like, do you make decisions based on like the trends? Um, since like the trends does have like some specialties on, you know, helping the founder to raise money quickly throughout that year. But afterwards, like, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, like, what do you think about the trends? Yeah, I, there is always the VC trend du jour. I mean, that just, I've been in uh, venture capital business for you know, 18 years and there's always the kind of the thing du jour. And, you know, that means sometimes startups are, if you're a founder and a startup, that sometimes you're in the hot space and sometimes you're not in the hot space. There's a reason it's the trend. It means it's something that's new and exciting where investors see promise and opportunity. You know, in some cases that means it's going to unfold and, and fulfill that promise. And sometimes it's not. And even when it does, uh, that doesn't mean there's going to be failures along the way. I, my recommendation to entrepreneurs would be to start the company that you want to start based on authentic experiences, which you've had and that give you an unfair advantage. And if it's in the hot space, then then ride that and use, take that to your advantage. And if it's not, don't worry about it. Find, use that, use that to your advantage as well and find the investors who, there are investors that intentionally shy away from whatever is perceived to be the hot space. Um, and not, not to get too hung up worried or not. We do as a firm, um, think that generative AI is is quite exciting. I mean, I think there, we're at a point where artificial intelligence is not just for imitating and analyzing and improving on existing designs, but actually can create something new. And I think that it's going to have transformative effects on both consumer applications, as well as, especially for creative professionals of any kind, you know, whether it's graphics designers, industrial designers, architects, Anyone that does creation, writers, I think so there, there I think there, there is a lot of hype, but it is, I think there's a lot of warrant to it. This is not to say that, you know, we've started to make some initial investments in the space and we'll continue to, but as I said before, you know, we're not, uh, we're a generalist fund. We're not, uh, we're not going to be turning ourselves into a generative AI fund for the next two years <laughs> and then change it to something else. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to make a number of investments over the coming years, but it's not the only thing that we do. What do you think is like a one skill that you feel like are most likely to make the founder successful? And then what do you think is one skill that like typically makes a VC successful? On the founder side, it is a the right balance between sheer persistence and adaptability. It's like you want to be able to just not give up, plow through when things are challenging. But on the flip side, startups are hard and you need to shift and change. And that can mean all the way from literally what's the problem statement that you're trying to solve all the way down to the tactics of like, okay, what do I need to do today? And so I think there's just a constant tension between being extremely resilient, but then being adaptive when you need to be. I think on the investor side, I think about a two by two net matrix. You need to, there's on one side, you either are right or wrong. And then you have to be, you know, there's either consensus or non-consensus. Obviously you don't want to be wrong. So you can get rid of those two. <laughs> and so you either have to be right in consensus or right and non-consensus. You know, to be right in consensus with what else the market is, you have to figure out a way to win. And that's hard. Or you are right, but non-consensus. And that is, that's hard too, to be able to invest in things that most people think is wrong. Eventually you're going to be right, but it takes a while for that to prove out. I, I use as a litmus test for a number of my investments. When I pitch it to other VCs, if they kind of look at me and scratch their head a little bit, it could be a good investment because it's it's non-consensus. But the ch a challenge is it's, it's pretty easy to be an investor to try to get cut up in the consensus. And that, that quadrant of 
consensus is wrong, that's a pretty big quadrant a lot of the time. It yeah. feels fine right there for a while until the, the wrong part starts to happen. We're at the last part of our interview, which is like a one minute fire run. Oh, okay. uh, so number one is like, what's your favorite book? Homeward Bound by uh, Thomas Wolfe. And it's a, it's a fiction uh, of a journey of a, a kind of a coming of age book about somebody returning, uh, going going away and then returning back to their home and seeing what, how, they, how they have changed and their, <laughs> their home has, hasn't. Yeah, Interesting. So uh, yeah. what's your information diet look like? So beyond books, maybe like newsletter or anything that like you subscribe to. Special tab. I read term sheet every day and, you know, it's kind of the, the basic and strictly VC and Dan Primax, uh, newsletter. And then, uh, right now, maybe a little different on, on, um, on generative AI, uh, it's called Ben's Bytes. It's, mm-hmm. it's roundup newsletter. It's awesome. And that's, yeah. uh, I have no dog in the hunt there. I just think it's, it's an awesome newsletter. Who made the biggest impact in your career? Uh, I would just point to the three people I've mentioned before, uh, Kevin Malloy, Rich Lovenel, and Mike Terrell. Um, each of them has taken a chance on me in some, in some way. You don't forget those. Uh, who will you invite to your dinner party? I'm going to invite people that are outside of tech land. You can be engaged, but I, you know, I'm having a dinner party. I want, I, I want to enjoy it. <laughs> and not talk about work. Speak of not talk about work. The last question is where can we find you outside of work? Uh, you can find me uh, running around my neighborhood in uh, suburban Boston and then uh, on the ski slopes. Uh, I'm a skier. I grew up, or I grew, when I was very young, I lived up in Canada for a little while. And so I started skiing when I was three years old. And this, uh, this is not the question you asked, but my, my second best job after being a VC was I was a, a children's ski instructor uh, for uh, a season and that's uh, that's a pretty good job to have. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, that actually have like nothing to do with VC. <laughs> um, three to six year old kids and, and that is a very different skill set to be able to teach three to six year olds how to ski because you can't just tell them. You can tell adults, okay, do this or do that. Like, you know, they say, oh, move your body this way. They, they don't have the, they don't have the connect here from ver- verbally to figure out, figure out a move. So you have to kind of trick them into following you to go the right way. Our last last question is, uh, where do you like to ski? Well, when I had spent the season out there, I spent it in Vail, although now I'm, I like skiing Utah. But we get a, uh, I have three young kids in, um, in the Northeast. Uh, Okemo is a, is a nice family mountain, so we go there a lot. Nice. Oh, yeah. cool. Thank you so much, David, for coming on the show today. Yeah, great. It was, it was awesome. You, you asked me to do real work and ask really good, insightful questions. So I, I always enjoy you know, having a good conversation. Mm-hmm.